So a very warm welcome again. And, and the topic we will be discussing today is the business environment reform for youth employment, especially for the African, Caribbean, and Pacific states. For those of you who are not very familiar with the topic, and uh, basically BER, business environment reform, means that government or the regulatory bodies are making systematic or effective changes to create uh, favorable conditions for businesses to be able to operate and thrive in. So the type of BER that we will be referring to in this webinar today will mainly focus on the increasing job opportunities and labor demand. Really excited to see that many of you are joining here today. Um, let me introduce myself very quickly. My name is Sue. I'm one of the technical advisors for the ICR facility, and I'll be your host moderator for the session today. So we okay, so let me uh, go ahead and introduce the purpose of the today's webinar. So the purpose of today's webinar is basically twofold. First of all, we would like to officially launch our latest report on this very important topic uh, through a presentation by our key author, Lim Homdeed, uh, who is here with us today on the call. And secondly, we also would like to hear from our esteemed panelists. We have four speakers, four invited guests who will be here to shed light on their insights and experiences. We purposefully chose to commission this report because we believe that the solutions to youth employment issues should go beyond addressing the the scale mismatch between the supply and demand across the ACB countries. Uh, uh, I don't need to tell you that anymore. There is a significant population of young people under 35. So despite this demographic advantage, young people still face many problems today in finding the jobs that they all deserve. That's why we are all gathered here today uh, to delve deeper into this very important topic and learn how BER, business environment reform, can be a positive catalyst for their youth em employment reforms. So the next slide, uh, we also have our agenda, which uh, will show you um, very simple agenda. So we will run this session for about an hour. First of all, starting with Lynn, and then we will give the floor to our donors, Miguel and Anthony from EU, uh, European Commission and OECPS, Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States. And we will move on to the panel discussions uh, with our panel speakers, followed by question and answer sessions. And before we close the session, I will be also introducing a little bit about the ICR facility and how we can support you on this agenda. So we would like to expect really active participations from you all. Um, and without further ado, I would like to invite um, the, the author, Lynn, for the presentation. Thank you, Sue, and um, good afternoon. I'm based in the UK, so it's afternoon for me, but um, welcome wherever you're dialing in from. Um, it's a pleasure and an honour for me to be here today presenting the report that I compiled um, on the basis of research which I conducted last year in 2023. Just a couple of pointers before I go on to talk through the report. Um, just to let you know that I undertook participatory research as well as a comprehensive review of existing reports and literature on youth employment across the ACP states, um, particularly um, reports and literature from international and multilateral organisations such as UN agencies, the World Bank and the ILO. I interviewed 21 key informants via video call and I hope some of them are with us today. Of the contributors, 57% were male and 43% were female, and they were from across Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific. In the report, we reference um, youth and we I base that on an age range of 18 to 35 years, but I would like to acknowledge that young women particularly often face similar issues much later into their adulthood particularly if they are looking for their first employment after having children and raise those children um, and until the point at which those children are a bit more independent. So sometimes women are facing the issues that I'll describe today um, up until the age of around 40. Furthermore, um, I would just like to highlight that I'll use the words youth or young people as shorthand 
but please be aware that there are several dimensions of this issue which are gendered and not all young people have an equitable experience of entering the labour market. For example, women, youth from minority ethnic groups and young persons with disabilities face particular barriers and often discrimination. For an example of the challenges faced by one Ghanaian woman with disabilities who we interviewed, um, there is a blog post on the ICR facility website and um, my colleague from the ICR facility will post that in the chat for you. This report specifically looks at business environment reform for youth employment, but many young people of course find work by starting their own business and often become employers of other young people. And the issue of youth entrepreneurship is covered in a separate ICR report. Next slide, please. So, um, <clears throat> just this the, my presentation today will cover um, six key areas. So, first of all, I'll talk through the context of youth unemployment in ACP countries. I'll touch on the decent work dilemma and then the barriers that young people face. I will also cover where the jobs are for youth and um, I will talk through the recommendations of the report and in the recommendations you'll see that I recommend a two-pronged approach um, and I'll explain more about that later and then finally we will share with you where you can find the report and download it. Next slide, please. So talking through the context of youth unemployment in the ACP countries, um, the inclusion of young people in the labour market and in society is essential both for the, their own economic prospects and well-being and that of their families, but also it's essential for overall economic growth and social cohesion. And the potential is huge. Um, the African Development Bank has um, found that in Africa alone, um, youth could contribute $500 billion to GDP by 2030. And similarly, elsewhere in the Caribbean and Pacific, increases in youth employment are predicted to lead to increases in GDP. But unfortunately, job creation is not keeping pace with the rate at which young people are entering the labour market. Between the year 2000 and 2020, half of all new labour market entrants globally were in Africa and Asia. And the response of yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, governments and multilateral organisations long predates the Sustainable Development Goals, which of course mention um, decent employment. Around a third of ACP countries have youth policies and several have national action plans on youth employment, which have often been created with the support of the ILO. However, the plans need to come off the paper and lead to concrete results. Business environment reform, that is the reform of the operating environment for businesses and the policies which support that are crucial. There's been a historic focus, as Sue mentioned in her introduction, on supply side interventions, that is helping youth to become more employable through education and skills initiatives. However, while young people may be more employable, they are not in employment. And this has been, been called a missing jobs crisis. Young people face some barriers which are generic for all labour market entrants. However, they also face barriers which are specific to their youth and their relative inexperience. And I will go into more detail on those shortly. So business environment reforms for youth employment therefore need to address those youth specific barriers as well as broader economic reforms. And this is why my report recommends a two pronged approach. Next slide, please. So the ultimate objective of business environment reform for youth employment should be decent work, which the ILO has defined as opportunities for men and women, women and men to obtain decent and productive work in conditions of freedom, equity, security and human dignity. In the context of many ACP countries, 
the agendas of more jobs and better jobs need to be implemented together at a pace whereby one does not negatively impact the other. Pushing too hard too soon on a decent work agenda may cause actual or perceived additional costs to employers which could act against job creation and it's really important for policymakers to be talking to employers to understand what these actual or perceived costs may be. And a key way of doing that and of managing that delicate balance between job quality and job quantity and in pursuit of inclusive growth is through multi-stakeholder collaboration and communication. And that can be facilitated through public-private dialogue, which includes and empowers youth. And that is the subject of another report in this series, which is downloadable from the ICR website. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that there are some very specific um, barriers for young people to employment. And these co um, consist of formal barriers and informal barriers. So when we talk about formal barriers, these include um, issues such as insufficient education, qualifications and experience. But importantly, as Sue already mentioned, um, in this context, a lot of our interviewees talked about the skills mismatch. So it wasn't so much that young people were poorly educated or qualified, but that they were not qualified to do the jobs that were available to them. Um, legal and governance frameworks can impact all workers, but particularly for young people who are, are relatively inexperienced, they may be desperate for their first opportunity to earn an income. They may face bias from employers who might think that they're not able to do the job or not capable. It may mean that young people are um, disproportionately impacted, for example, by the lack of legal or governance frameworks or for, by um, poor implementation of them. One example of this would be worker protections. Young people may not know what their rights are and they may fall into situations where they are being exploited or unable to seek recourse to those rights. And finally, on the formal barriers, infrastructure constraints can um, impact young people. These might be physical infrastructure, so due to a lack of capital or assets, young people may not be able to travel to work. This might be digital infrastructure, so young people may be digitally well skilled but they may lack access to internet enabled devices or internet networks and also interviewees mentioned to us a lack of job matching infrastructure so a lack of systems or spaces or places um, where young people and employers can come together and be matched where young people can find employment opportunities and this often impacts on um, who gets the jobs and um, that is related to the informal barriers so sometimes people are getting jobs because they know employers and if young people don't know employers then they are disadvantaged on the informal barriers social social cultural norms play a role these may influence attitudes or bias towards young people and um, particularly towards young people with disabilities or women um, women may face um, bias or discrimination around their, um, if they are of childbearing age or they may have childcare responsibilities. Young people may also experience bias based on their political or religious affiliation or cultural factors or their ethnic grouping that may disadvantage them. Young people also may be less well connected. They obviously have limited, may have limited work experience and they may not have the connections that they need to unlock the jobs that they want. Particularly young people from disadvantaged backgrounds who may come from jobless households so they don't have relatives and family members who can um, introduce them to employers or explain to them what particular workplaces are like. And as I mentioned at the top of the se session, there is a, dimension, a gender dimension to this. Women are more likely to be unemployed, economically in, inactive, working informally, 
subject to bias, harassment or discrimination. And there is a further ICR series on women's economic empowerment that is available online. Next slide, please. So, um, in relation to where the jobs are for young men and women in ACP countries, this is highly context specific, so it will differ from region to region, continent to continent and country to country. It may even differ within countries, but across ACP economies, agriculture is likely to provide a majority of jobs, including also in related industries such as agri-processing. In many countries, infrastructure and construction will be a means not only for young people to find jobs now, but also to galvanise greater economic development in support of further job creation. Some ACP economies have extractive industries, while some will be seeking to capitalise on renewable energy. People I spoke to in the Pacific and Caribbean had optimism for the blue economy, and similarly in those con countries, um, service industries had potential, including um, tourism and hospitality. Digital jobs have potential, but they are not a silver bullet solution. The potential of digital needs to be adequately assessed for each national context and also accompanied by infrastructure investment and adequate worker protections. We heard in the interviews of young people working online where they were subject to um, poor working conditions and were not able to um, seek support for that. Next slide, please. So coming to the recommendations in the report, as I mentioned earlier, um, I recommend a two pronged approach. So there are four recommendations and the first two relate to the specific needs and characteristics of unemployed youth. So recommendation one is to integrate the reform suite and recommendation two is to address youth barriers. And then the second prong, if you like, is about business environment reform to enhance the business operating environment and boost job creation now and in the future. Because of the sheer numbers of young people in ACP countries, um, boosting job creation will help them, but it's important, as recommendation three says, to think about business productivity now, but also, as recommendation four says, to invest in growth areas for the future. Next slide, please. So recommendation one is about integrating the reform suite. And this is about um, bringing together that combination of supply and demand side interventions that I mentioned, and making sure that they're aligned with national economic objectives. So it's possible that in some ACP countries that might involve training policymakers, so helping them to understand the specific needs and concerns of young people. In many ACP countries, it's necessary to join up policymaking across government departments, across different levels, of government from the local to the national. And one way to do that is through a single policy or action plan on youth employment. One way to get um, higher visibility and buy into that policy or action plan is through the appointment of a high profile lead who can lend visibility and accountability to um, the priority that policymakers are placing on youth employment and that there are examples of how that's been successful across ACP states. It's necessary to consider youth in non-youth specific reform, so really to mainstream that youth consideration across the board. And in many ACP countries, it's been very difficult to um, build evidence bases for policy decisions. So the, th the final aspect of this recommendation is really to use situational analyses, to collect data and evidence, to make sure that policy decisions are underpinned with that evidence and that they are quality decisions. Next slide, please. Recommendation two is about addressing those very specific youth barriers. Young people often lack work experience, 
networks and labour market knowledge, as I've mentioned, and that can make employers hesitant to hire them. And this is what we call the experience trap. Young people lack experience, but they find it hard to get the experience because of that bias on the part of some employers. So really this recommendation um, talks about designing effective employment matching and recruitment services. They may be public, publicly run, or it may be that um, policymakers work with um, other stakeholders to develop something that really works. These can be um, physically based in um, offices or drop-in centres, but also it's worth thinking about digital and mobile solutions, particularly because young people tend to be more digitally um, well-informed, but also because um, young people are very disparate and they're dispersed across national territories. It's really important to engage employers and educate them in the benefits of multi-generational diverse workforces. And there's a body of evidence that can help um, policymakers to do that. And it may be necessary to incentivize youth recruitment. And there are examples in the report of how that's been done through offering employers access to benefits if they recruit a certain profile of employees or by offering wage subsidies to support um, empl employers to take on young people. Next slide, please. So coming on to the two recommendations that look at the economy more broadly, recommendation three is about increasing business productivity. So that's really about enabling the businesses that currently exist to grow and develop so that they can create more jobs in order to maintain their growth. Um, and micro, small and medium sized enterprises are really critical in this. They're the greatest employer of young people and they're the engine of most ACP economies. So it's really important to boost overall employment growth in order for the um, magnitude of young people to find employment. This involves streamlining regulatory environments, so really checking that regulations aren't working against each other to disadvantage growth of businesses. Um, policymakers can identify high, high potential sectors and firms and support them to um, grow and employ young people. It's necessary, as I mentioned earlier, to take a balanced approach to incentivizing formalization. It's really important to address the missing middle. In a lot of ACP countries, there are many micro and small enterprises and a number of large multinationals, but not so many medium sized and growing enterprises in the middle. So it's important to help the small ones to grow and to encourage the, the large ones to um, broaden their supply chains and um, facilitate the growth of what's called the missing middle. It's important to identify uh, opportunities in rural areas and in rural economies, as well as in the cities, and also to ensure a policy balance between youth mobility and youth employability. Particularly island states in the Caribbean and Pacific have maybe used mobility schemes to alleviate the immediate um, problem of youth unemployment, but it's also important to um, encourage the development of jobs in the home economy so that young people can access them. Next slide, please. So the final recommendation is really about looking to the future and investing in growth areas. Um, often policymakers are occupied with the here and the now, but it's really important to develop concepts and policies for the future. And in doing that, it's important for policymakers to understand the nuanced and context specific impacts of the future of work. And in order to do this, um, it's necessary to stimulate multi stakeholder action to critically appraise the potential of digital. And it, that can be done through using public private dialogue to understand where the growth is and what the skills need are, needs are, and enable policymakers to really build supporting enabling environments, not just for the private sector, 
but also for the social economy. Next slide, please. Um, I can see I'm slightly short of time, so I will leave this quote because um, you'll be receiving the slides um, after this event and you can read it yourself. Um, and next slide, please. The final slide of my slides will show you where you can download the report and you will, as I mentioned, you'll see these um, when you receive them by email. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you find the report um, interesting and useful when you have the opportunity to read it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, that was really informative and also very comprehensive. You get lots of reactions in the, on the screen, as you can see. So uh, good job. And my uh, colleagues are already sharing the links uh, for the reports and any other knowledge products that ICR uh, is uh, producing on the Youth Economic Empowerment Series. So please feel free to download them if you're interested. And one thing I would also like to share is that we're trying to make sure uh, that this webinar is as inclusive as possible. So there is a show caption option at the very, very bottom of the page, uh, along with the chat, uh, interpretations, uh, whiteboards, etc. So if you want to uh, see the captions, please feel free to use that as well. And uh, Let's now move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, may I invite uh, Miguel Campolopis first from European Union to give a few words uh, as a welcome remark. Miguel. Thank you, Sue, and, and thank you, Lynn, for, for this very comprehensive presentation. So, indeed, my name is Miguel Campo. Uh, I work in the European Commission in Director General for International Partnership, uh, which is in charge of, of uh, development cooperation and, and support to partner countries. And within that director general, I work in the unit in charge of private sector development, uh, trade, employment and value chains. And we are uh, the, the fathers of this facility, for the ICR facility, that together with the ACP, the German government and the British Council was created right before COVID began, to be to be honest. And, and this facility has evolved over the years and we've been... Uh, at the beginning, focusing on a more general business environment reform, but then three years ago, we, we decided to shift a bit the approach and to focus on two specific segments, which is youth and, and women. And why both those two segments? Well, first, because they are clearly underserved in terms of uh, services, but also, and most importantly, in terms of policies. Uh, although we all acknowledge the relevance of providing uh, uh, policies and, and reforms that are adapted to the needs of these two segments. The reality is that what we see, this is more often a theory than a practice. And therefore we wanted to use this facility to support public and private actors to, to move in that direction. But also because the European Commission is very much committed with, with youth, not as a group in itself, but as a, as a key part of the development process, because they represent not only the present, the need of people right now living in the ACP countries that are seeking for jobs, for opportunities to expand their capacities, but also, and more importantly, because they represent the future. Because if we don't create the conditions for uh, the actual generations and future generations to, to be able to grow, have a decent job, uh, expand their horizons, uh, and, and build uh, a decent uh, life, then we won't be contributing at all to, to development uh, in those countries. And therefore, we will be missing the target that we have as a European Union. You know? And in particular, I want to do emphasis on, on something that, that Lynn was saying, because it's very much a, 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 in my, my heart, and also because it's a, a very uh, important flagship initiative that the European Commission is, is, is doing, in this case, in particular, for Sub-Saharan Africa. But we have similar initiatives, both for, for the Pacific and, and, the, and the Caribbean. And it has to do with this uh, disparity between population growth and unemployment creation. No? And, and Lynn made, made already a reference to this. But I think I would like to add something, which is that the, the World Bank estimates, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, estimates that by 2035, uh, 450 more million people more will be living in Sub-Saharan Africa. But if nothing changes, we will only be able to create additionally 100 million more employment or jobs, which means that we have a gap uh, of 350 million employments. That has to do, as Lynn was explaining, with a number of factors, of course. And it has to do with the capacity of different segments of the economy to absorb those employment. It has to do with um, the public sector being able to, to produce or offer enough uh, jobs, opportunities. It has to do with uh, 
private sector, especially big businesses. But in our case, where we are focusing is especially on the, the entrepreneurship and the early stage businesses, what Lynn was calling the missing middle. And, and why are we focusing on this? Because we, we feel that ACP is a region that has a, as a characteristic, a very innovative and very uh, powerful and, and, and driven by, 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 by the will to create new, new products, new instruments, new opportunities of, of youth, especially youth and, and, and women. But at the same time, it's, it's a region where, where the system works against that creativity and that innovation. Uh, from the policy and regulatory uh, uh, side, but also the access to finance, the access to services, the access to equal opportunities. And therefore, we collectively as a community, both the partner countries, the private actors, the public actors, but also the donor community, we need to really focus on that if we want to really create change. And that means acknowledging that, that there are certain structural problems that we have to face and that we have to, to, to work. And we have to also be critical with how we are deploying our instruments and how those instruments can be more effectively targeting young people. That's where we, I, we have created Investing in Young Businesses in Africa, which is an initiative that brings together 11 European member states to try to change the way we have been working traditionally and create better and more opportunities for, for young people. And it's not only about the missing middle in terms of, of those businesses, it's, by, it's about creating a clear path for all those young uh, men and women from ACP countries, or in this case for Sub-Saharan Africa, that are trying to really build a business, be innovative, uh, support a green uh, um, growth, uh, support an equal growth, uh, a growth that provides opportunities for all uh, the members of the society, and that are really struggling to make this dream or these ideas and put them in practice. And therefore, it is our obligation as, as, as donors, but also as, as, as part of a community of actors who are engaged in, in this, to create those opportunities and make sure that those young people who want to go through that path have the opportunities in the means. So ICR has been working substantially on this. As Lynn was explaining, we have this report and we have other reports. I strongly recommend that you visit the ICR webpage. I think it's one of the best products that we have in ICR. The, the support that we provide are, is excellent, but the webpage provides a huge uh, amount of information on reports, blog posts, videos, on all the different interviews that we've been doing. And I think it's a very interesting tool for you to learn from what's happening in other countries, in other interventions. And also, I, I, I would suggest that you follow up what we are doing in the commission, because it's not only the investing in business in Africa, we have a number of initiatives supporting youth from giving political voice to giving them the opportunities to grow their businesses, to creating the conditions, uh, supporting vocational training, working both, as Lynn was saying, on the demand and supply side of the, of, the, of the equation to make sure that indeed over the next 10, 15 years, all those young people that are being born right now will indeed have a better chance to have an opportunity, grow, have decent jobs and have a decent life uh, to 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 live and to and to enjoy. So I'll stop here. Uh, I'll give uh, the floor back to to Sue. Um, I really hope that you have a, a very interesting uh, workshop. And uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us as ICR team, as European Commission, um, to follow up what we're doing and and see how we can support. You. So thank you very much and good afternoon. Over thank to you, you Sue. Miguel. Thank you. Um, uh, can I now invite Anthony Brand, uh, MSME expert from OECBS, for a brief remark as well? Anthony. Hello. Thank you, Sue. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So good afternoon or good, good morning, good night, ladies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to um, say good afternoon and to give warm greetings on behalf of our Secretary General, Mr. George Rebello Pinto Shakoti, and our Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Junior Lodge. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this important webinar on business environment reform for youth employment in the ACP region, organized by the Investment Climate Reform Facility. The ICR facility, as it's popularly known, is a program funded by the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States and the European Union under the 11th European Development Fund. And I'd like to extend my gratitude to each of you for taking the time to participate in this very meaningful discussion. Today, as Miguel mentioned, we have gathered to address the critical issue that affects the economies and young people across the 79 
OSPS member states in Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific. The topic of empowering the youth to actively participate in the economic growth of our countries is of utmost importance to achieve FDG1, no poverty. It's crucial for us to acknowledge that a significant proportion of our population is under 35 years old, as mentioned, and the young population is not only the future, but is also the present. And their potential positive ideas driving sustainability skills and must be harnessed in order to drive the sustainable development and prosperity in our nations. As the OACPS, we believe that creating an enabling environment for youth and women entrepreneurship and employment is key to unlocking the economic potential of our countries. Facilitating business reforms targeted towards empowering the youth will foster employment opportunities, increase income levels, and ultimately lead to poverty reduction. By engaging and, and empowering the youth, we can build an inclusive and sustainable economy that leaves no one behind. To support this, we also very importantly need a shift in mindset regarding the perceptions of youth and their skill sets. Today's webinar is to provide a platform to, for stakeholders to share experiences, best practices, and, and innovative ideas for business reform, specifically targeting the youth. I was really very happy to, to hear the report of Lean, where like she spoke about ensuring like the business environment for youth includes the regu regulations which are there to empower the youth. And if I give a particular a story, a personal story that I know of, I know of like someone from the Caribbean, from, from my island, who at the age of between 18 and 21, actually went for a job. This person went for a job and was told in no uncertain terms that he wasn't going to get the job, not because of his skills or lack thereof, but simply because where he was from. And this is something which to this day, 30 years later, 35 years later, still affects him. So I think that we really need to be able to develop the, the, the regulatory environment, which will actually prevent this type, of, this type of discrimination against youth. So today's dialogue will help and will enable us to identify policy and strategies that not only remove the barriers, but also create opportunities for youth and for young entrepreneurs to thrive in our respective countries. By enhancing access to finance, providing preferential regulatory frameworks and offering capacity building measures, we can ensure that our youth are equipped with the necessary resources and skills to succeed in the business sector. In closing, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the entire ICR facility team for organizing this webinar, the consultants who've worked on preparing the reports, which I think are really excellent. And as Miguel said, our development partners at the European Commission and also the ICR facility have really developed this program into one of the best programs that we are implementing at this time. I encourage all participants to actively engage in the discussions, share experiences, and put forward innovative ideas so that together we can shape a brighter future for our youth and build economies that are resilient, thriving, and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony, for those uh, wonderful and, and valuable insights. Uh, let's now move on to the session that we are all waiting for uh, the panel discussion. So we have all four speakers on board with us. And instead of me going through uh, and reading their profiles, I would like to invite each and every one of them to introduce themselves, their name, and where they are working at the moment. So may I start with uh, Abdel Malik? Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Zhu. Good morning, good afternoon, good good evening, uh, wherever you are. My name is Abdel Malik Mohammed. I'm currently working with International Labour Organization as the Employment and Labour Market Policies Specialist covering the entire Caribbean region. But prior to this, I also spent over 15 years working in Africa and the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Julia, do you want to go next? Yes, uh, my name is good afternoon, good evening, wherever you find yourself, and thank you for having me. My name is Julia Mituzana. I'm from the Namibia Investment Promotion Development Board, and I am um, currently working with um, in, uh, investors aligning skills to investors' needs, and previously I've been working in the education sector, namely in the TVET sector. Um, uh, that's all for now. 
Thank you. Good to have you on board, Julia. Um, uh, can I go to you next, Joshua? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. My name is Joshua Waugh, uh, a Senior Venture Building Manager at the Job Tech Alliance. And specifically, we focus on providing support to businesses that provide access to work opportunities for youth um, across Africa. Thank you. Last but not least, can I invite Farai Dooley uh, for the introduction? Good day, everyone. I hope that you are well. My name is Farai Dooley. I am the Africa Livelihoods and Education Lead for Accenture Development Partnerships. So a lot of experience in looking at at issues of employment, entrepreneurship, and education on the continent, especially as it pertains to young people, really excited about this discussion. Thank you all uh, for that introduction. Um, so now let, let me kick off with the very first questions. We all heard from Lynn earlier that policy harmonization is really key when it comes to developing youth employment action plans. Those needs to be aligned with the national economic policy. So I would like to hear from you, Abdel Malik, first uh, from your experience, how can countries can ensure that there is this alignment between um, action plans and uh, as well as the economic policies? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sue, and thanks uh, to uh, Lin Homdi for the uh, comprehensive presentation. I think, I mean, youth and employment is, I mean, a concerning policy issue. Uh, in almost all regions and, and particularly, I mean, in developing countries, including uh, Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific. And as we have seen, I mean, the statistics, uh, I mean, reveal some alarming information and trends. Uh, I don't want to, I mean, repeat the same statistics, but I just want to underscore a few things which are, I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, the statistics relating to the to youth who are already in the labor market, who, who who are lucky to find, I mean, jobs. I mean, their work is concentrated in in informal, low low paid, low skilled sectors. And then we nowadays we also focus on uh, youth who are neither in in education, uh, employment, or training, because it is an healthy, I mean, uh, indicator for the state of the youth. Uh, and if, if you go back to the statistics for the past 20 years, for instance, in Africa, you will find that the youth employment and employment rate is the same as it used to be before 20 years. So that tells us, I mean, uh, something uh, structural uh, is, I mean, happening in, the, in, in Africa, for instance. So in response to these, I mean, challenges, I mean, a lot of countries have implemented uh, various uh, policy measures. As for instance, some of them have developed the standalone youth employment policies. Uh, with a focus on education and active labor market policies but uh, i mean i mean eventually they recognize that these policies are not responsive to i mean the changes the dramatic changes happening in the labor market uh, and one is those policies were evaluated i mean findings a lot of findings show that i mean these policies alone have not yielded uh, i mean significant labor market outcomes for the youth so, I mean, the, the, the alternative policy process now is to align youth strategies and action plans with economic policies with a focus on the demand side policies. Uh, that means, I mean, we need to, I mean, uh, stimulate uh, or, 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 or uh, policies on, uh, that are favorable to youth when it comes to um, job creation. And that have to do with macroeconomic, sectoral, and enterprise development policies. So that is, I mean, I mean the kind of, I mean, uh, policy integration uh, that has been happening during the last few years. So, uh, and, and some countries have already taken additional steps by clearly integrating youth employment objectives in national development policies, poverty reduction strategies, uh, climate change, and policies that have implications on jobs, uh, quality of jobs, such as productivity, uh, enhancing uh, strategies in agriculture, mining, and tourism. So I, I think those kind of integrated policy approach offer a significant, I mean, potential to facilitate transition and stimulate employment creation for youth. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel Malik, for that. Um, can I now go to you, Julia? I would like to understand better how it is done in Namibia as well. How do you work with public reformers as well as private stakeholders for the integrated policy actions? Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. Um, the government of the Republic of Namibia um, have recently introduced a youth tax incentive 
and a national internship program that is really aimed at addressing youth unemployment that is standing at 46%. Um, the youth tax incentives is aimed at employers, especially in the private sector and commercial public enterprises to take on more interns and in exchange for that, um, grant them uh, valuable work experience, professional registration, and also making sure that they transition in the world of work. Uh, apart from that, we've got a well-articulated TVET uh, uh, Act and policies, um, that all, and also national sector committees that allows private sector to give input into curriculum, and also making sure that our young people in the TVET sector develop hands-on skills, and also making sure that they transition into MSME and also stimulating entrepreneurship in Namibia. Thank you, Julia. You touched on the skills part a little bit, young people, how uh, they also need some particular support as well. So now I would like to touch on that a little bit because some of the young uh, job seekers, particularly first-time job seekers, face barriers when it comes to um, for example, they don't have ne their network or they don't have a particular experience to showcase. So I would like to now um, come to Farid and understand from you, from your current experience, as well as from your previous experience at YES, Youth Employment Services, uh, wh what kind of measures have you taken to design employment matching programs so that young people also know where to find uh, the job opportunities? Thanks so much for the question. And I think that in the context Lynn had provided, she really painted the picture in terms of what are the barriers to youth finding employment. And it's so important that before we look at linking youth to opportunities, we take these barriers into account. And if we look at the barriers that young people face in finding employment, we can group them into a number of, of, of your buckets, right? One would be education. We know that education plays a huge role in terms of what the paths look like. Another one can be transition. So how does a young person transition practically from learning to earning? And networks play a huge role in the transitioning young people are on. And then lastly, looking at jobs. You know, what are jobs? What are the sort of jobs? Looking at the gig economy and there's so much happening. We need to look at, you know, when we are looking at designing employment matching for young people, it's key to look at how do we transition young people effectively from learning to earning. And we know that a huge barrier and challenge for young people is in, and again, Lynn had touched on this, on the skills mismatch, which we know exists across a number of our countries, on information asymmetries, young people think they know what they need to study or what skills they need to gain to be employed, but that there's a mismatch between what the labor market is saying. So as a result of that information that the labor market is requesting is not being heard or being shared with young people. And as a result, there's information asymmetries. Another big aspect is our social capital. The unfortunate reality is that if you don't have social capital, it is difficult to get into rooms where you can find employment opportunities. And I think from my experience, one of the best initiatives I've seen that have looked at designing effective employment matching solutions for young people is our model in South Africa called the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention. That is a comprehensive government coordination response to say, how do we bring various players into the same room and how do we coordinate our efforts to combat youth unemployment? And it's no secret that South Africa has got one of the highest unemployment rates in the world for young people. What we've seen with the PYEI is that they have created a national pathway management network. So a platform that's called SA Youth. SA Youth is a free zero rated platform for any young person in the country, whether you are South African or not, to be able to access to find opportunities for learning and earning. What's even more attractive about the platform is that it's free for employers as well. So what this initiative has done is to remove these barriers of information asymmetries, of the lack of social capital, of the skills mismatch and say, let us bring young people closer to employers so that they can find each other on various opportunities and let's make it accessible. And I think what's been really great about this is that 
there's this coordinated effort between the private sector, between government, between various organizations, like an Accenture, like a YES, and we need more initiatives like this across the continent, across the Caribbean, so that we can coordinate our efforts and avoid working in silos, which detriments the progress of young people. Thank you, Farid. Um, it's true not only that young people face barriers, but also we have blockers on the employer side as well. You mentioned a bit about the gig economy. So now I would like to turn to Joshua as well, uh, because he works in the job tech sector. Maybe if you could introduce a little bit what job tech sector means and how can we leverage digital solutions to decrease um, biases and assumptions against young people. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sue. Um, so when we talk about really job tech, we're basically saying the use of technology to act, to facilitate the access to work opportunities, right? So platforms who have built who have built their solutions around in connecting, you know, work opportunities to individuals to help them build their livelihoods, right? And we've seen that growing um, in, in Africa. We've seen a lot of platforms that we're working with today. Um, one of the key things I would say is basically, and, and Lynn had also highlighted to this through her, her, her report was essentially the skill gap, right? Um, how do we begin to upskill for platform level work, right? If you think about the gig economy and how do you begin to skill people to ensure that they're able to fit into the type of work that would really come in uh, within the gig economic, uh, economy in the future as well. But we're also seeing a lot, even on um, the, the employer side as well, they also begin to do collaborative research um, really around how they find how young people can find skills that they, they would basically be beneficial to them in, in, in employment. Um, also, we're also seeing things like talent clouds being built uh, across Africa. I know the MasterCard Foundation essentially had invested with uh, Gibea to build a talent cloud, basically to engage young people, um, source them, train them, but also engage them in the types of skills and resources that they'll need to actually thrive in you know, in the work environment. So again, we're seeing a lot of things on the employer side where they're doing so much to also even point towards scaling platforms and say, hey, actually, this is what we want you know, people to be learning through your platform, because that way they're employable uh, for us now and also employable for us in the future. Thank you for that, Joshua. Uh, now I would like to switch gear a little bit and then trying to touch on the uh, sector specific, industry specific, because we are um, all understand that the more uh, businesses prosper as well, the more economies grow, and that's when they can create job opportunities. So I would like to uh, now come to Julia and ask uh, at NIPDB, for example, how do you identify potential job rich sector uh, to attract investment in and or to particularly like support? And when you do that, how do you make sure that these targeted sectors are also benefiting young people? I think you're on mute. Sorry for that. So what we have done in terms of identifying economic sectors, we have collaborated with the Harvard uh, Harvard School, and, and we have come up with certain sectors or specific sectors such as renewable uh, renewable energy, food industry, tourism, mining, and e-commerce, and that can contribute to economic growth and also culminate into uh, employment and also MSME development in, in our ecosystem. So complementary to that, we have also we are also busy implementing skills for trade and economic diversification. That is really aimed at looking at whole value chains in an in a specific economic uh, sector and making sure that we address a skills mismatch. We also address employment opportunities. And apart from that, we have also gone another step further, and that is really to report to the global accelerator. Now we are a member state of the UN. And so what we are going to do is with the Global Accelerator is really to support uh, the acceler accelerated progress towards the sustainable development uh, goals and also support the creation of decent jobs primarily in the green dig digital and care economy. And this is where we are in terms of, and I'm quite sure that this effort is really going to benefit young people in the long run. Do you have any advice uh, for the governments of Malik for from ILO perspective if they are also wanting to try this targeted sector promotion approach? Absolutely, I would say that um, it must be a deliberate, uh, a deliberate action from government 
to really identify the sectors because during COVID, when the when the when there was a downturn into the world economies, they say that the 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 the, the, econ the world economics turnaround was around specific economic sectors. And we can see with the fifth industrial revolution, it provides new opportunities. And that is these new opportunities that government need to hone in and make sure that we create the demand and the, uh, the demand and supply for, for, for skills and for young people in these new sectors. Thank you. And when we are talking about the sector, we also cannot ignore the, the technology sector, how it is also disrupting our day to day life, uh, the way we do our work and also the way the future of even our job. So I would like to quickly learn from Joshua that, for example, these kind of tech advancements in the MSME sector, how does that help young people to secure jobs? Uh, again, one thing we're, we're, be, we're seeing, you know, grow within you know, the African spaces, more and more ways in which people make money and earn money. One thing I'd say is people are going to make money and you know, earn a living through a portfolio of work, right? Where they're basically using digital uh, services to monetize their skills. So again, one of the key things we've, we've also identified is what we call um, vertically integrated platforms. And these are platforms which enable anyone basically access um, money. And that's through things like monetizing their skills, so providing them the infrastructure to allow them sell either to a global audience, to a local audience, but also promote their arts, crafts, and talents as well. One of the platforms we're working with um, recently, known as Class, allows anyone to basically, from the comfort of their home, digitize a, their learning experience, teaching whatever course that they wanted or whatever course that they were experts on, and allowing people to actually pay to actively you know, attend those class remotely. So we're seeing young people, you know, be able to monetize their skills, monetize their talent um, by using accessing digital platforms that provide them access to markets, access to financial services, but also the digital infrastructure to actively create um, businesses and, and, and promote their business. Thank you. We're really running out of time. Sorry about that. Um, and so that means we have to wrap up the panel discussions really, really soon. So I would like to uh, invite uh, one word from each and every one of you. Uh, what will be the key takeaway that you would like to give uh, to the audience? Uh, who would like to start by? Maybe, maybe Farai? I think the takeaway from my side in one word would be the importance of collaboration. We have to have collaboration and coordination between government, private sector, and young people themselves. Thank you. So we, as ICR as well, we cannot really promote enough about PPD public public dialogue as well. Um, so next on my screen is Abdel Malik. Uh, what would be the takeaway that you would like to give uh, to the audience? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sua. What I want to say is that, I mean, the labor market is uh, evolving, I mean, more rapidly than I mean than we think. So, I, what I would suggest is to I mean uh, invest a little uh, invest policies that boost job creation for youth, and a special emphasis should be placed on policies targeting women, particularly young women, including care policies and other gender responsive policies. Thank you. Thank you, and Julia, do you want to go next? Uh, I think you're on mute. With our young demographic dividend in Africa, I would definitely say that we need to position ourselves as a reskilling and a, a reskilling and upskilling hub, and also making sure that we embark upon skills exchange programs with countries that have a well-defined talent ecosystem and and, and 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 demonstrating that economic growth, so that we can grow our talent and exchange instead of having a brain drain. So I think that is one program that we are busy with, with uh, you know, really exchanging between Germany and Namibia, and that is really exchanging um, young people to go and work and, and, and obtain the exposure in their country and coming back one day uh, to Namibia to plan back in terms of the skills that they have obtained in, 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 in Germany. Yeah. Thank you. Abdel Malik? Uh, uh, happy to, to just go last. Um, I think that we need to focus on where the demand is. Um, right now, we understand that the 
the demand for jobs in, in Africa is lacking and we need to build the infrastructure that allows us to meet the demand either globally or locally. So we need to look into where the demand is and actually build the infrastructure to support uh, and service that demand, whether it's upskilling or reskilling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know that we uh, have to move on to the question and answer session, but we don't really have much time anymore. And then I can see that in a Q&A uh, box that some of the questions has been answered already. So we have to um, kind of leave it at that. And if you have any further questions as well, please feel free to email us as well. And then you can also uh, feel free to um, uh, reach, and, uh, reach out to the panel the panelist on the LinkedIn. Um, for the next, I would like to also uh, uh, request everyone to uh, leave your feedback as well. Uh, my colleagues already shared the links for the uh, survey questions as well. I promise you it only takes about two minutes because we would like to understand how we can improve these webinar sessions for the future as well. So this is uh, just to uh, move on to the next part. I would like to also introduce a little bit about the ICL facility before we officially conclude. Uh, so what we do and also how we can potentially support you all on this very important agenda as well. The ICL facility is a multi-donor funded program. We aim to support uh, public sector as well as private sector organizations and DFIs, Diploma Finance Institutions in Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries. We try to improve the business environment and also public-private dialogue. By doing this, we try to overcome barriers and create better conditions for businesses, particularly to achieve women's economic empowerment, like Miguel said. So we actually work on three key work streams. The first one is 90 days technical assistance program. So that is basically uh, responding to your project proposals. And secondly, we also give tailor-made capacity building support to the subnational and, and regional DFIs as well, development finance institution. Last but not least, we also do our own research and then share the best practices and lesson learns among the key stakeholders in the ACP region. Uh, next slide, please. So in the next slide, we can see that um, this is just some examples of how ICR facility can support everyone on the youth specific agenda. Uh, so we not only uh, work on this topic, but also other areas as well, um, investment promotion, for example, green economy, uh, et cetera. So if you have any specific requests, this is just to give you an example. And this is just, um, for example, on the youth uh, agenda, we can help you uh, gather the data evidence to identify sector, potential sector for youth employment. Also, we can support you for the policy review as well, especially from the youth mainstreaming perspectives and, and, and to help you better do the uh, public-private dialogue as well, youth-inclusive public-private dialogue. So with that, I would like to um, uh, officially conclude today's webinar as well. Um, and um, I only have one job left to do, which is um, to thank everyone um, to for their active participation, especially our speakers and also donors as well for their valuable contributions uh, as well today. And also my colleagues in the background who work very hard to put together this webinar and who are now engaging in the chat box as well. Thank you all very much. Um, I wish you all a very great day ahead. Please don't forget to um, fill out the questionnaires for the feedback. Thank you.